there are 40 occurrences or so during the week that somebody needs to think about food. And while they could focus in the gym on their squat for 90 minutes, and that being important, are they focusing on that all day? So it's very, very hard to always be eating and be mindful with your nutrition of what your other goals are. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and that is Matt Reynolds. And today we have Jillian Ward with us. And there's somebody sitting in the background. I don't know who that is. That's Stacy Rudnitsky. Oh, okay, okay. Miss Stacy, she's also backlit, here. so that she's just yeah. this angelic. We're shooting some tell. videos tomorrow with Jillian and Stacy, so she's she's just working back there. Very good. Well, this is a part ten of the Getting Started series that we've been working on now for over two months. Amazing. And it might be the final one. You said this is the final one, and I thought, maybe we need to do the what to do when LP starts to run out show. Yeah. Well, I mean, we did we did like how to grind and why that's kind of similar, right? Like yeah. what that, but that's, you're right. You want to do a programming, the next step in programming sort of episode. For yeah, I started. think so. Do I we think need so, that in getting started? Um, uh, is uh, how is about, week 14 uh, still getting started? <laughs> how about we can do uh, getting started with stopping getting started? <laughs> right, the end of getting started. Yeah, when when getting started doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know. That might be an okay show. I don't know. So we were Jillian and I were talking earlier about um, just the the role that nutrition plays in this in this whole world, and uh, in, in in when I say our, the world, I mean in in our industry in the fitness world, and I think that people tend to have a uh, an sort of nutrition has an overbearing relationship on their life or the other way around. They just completely forget. They're just like, I just want to get strong and I don't give a fuck. Right. Right. I'm just going to eat whatever and trying to figure out the right balance there of a, of a right relationship with food and nutrition, because it's, it is super important for performance, for health, for all those things that we talk about. Like we, everybody wants to look better. We get it, but aesthetics is not the primary goal for us. And, and really for most of our clients, performance might not be the primary goal either, although performance is a major goal, but it's really health and quality of life. And you can't have health and quality of life without some sort of proper balance of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to talk to Jillian about that. We've had Jillian on the show before. Jillian's, I don't remember what episode that was, but she gave a great interview, kind of tells her story of she, she's been a, a sort of phenom athlete her entire life. Um, and at the same time, though, what are you laughing at? Hamburg is laughing. Well, I, I'm just I'm just thinking about what's going on in Jillian's head right now. Well, I I just want to I'm about to turn it over to her, but I wanted to set it up in that she's had times in her life that she you you've basically eaten whatever you want. Yes, <laughs> and you've and you've also had times where you ate very neurotically, right? Like where you were obsessed about what you ate because you've been really sort of at the top of the game of of the sport of CrossFit, at powerlifting, as a bodybuilder, you've done all of those things. And so some of those times in your life, you like it was pizza and Oreos, and other times it was like, it was insanely strict. And so Jillian's really got a lot of um, experience on both ends of the spectrum. And so that's really why I thought you'd make a great guest to come on and talk. Uh, Jillian's our lead nutrition coach. She's She does a great job for us, but she's got, I just want her to talk about her experience and, and what she's seeing and, yeah, so welcome to the show. Thank you. So a little bit of about what I wanted to talk about is my philosophy regarding nutrition as a whole and an effective way to be a nutrition coach. So what I, one of the challenges is when we coach athletes, you know, we coach them, they train three times a week. So they've got to focus or four times a week, maybe eight hours a day in the gym. And they're able to wrap their week, mind around, right, yeah, eight hours a, week, a week in the yeah. gym. And they're able to wrap their mind around, you know, squat is my biggest priority. And then we talk about nutrition with them. But, you know, somebody might eat 50 times a week. So the average person eats at least three meals a day or probably three meals a day, two snacks. So there are 40 occurrences or so during the week that somebody needs to think about food. 
And while they could focus in the gym on their squat for 90 minutes and that being important, are they focusing on that all day? And at 8.30 in the morning, the squat might, most, might be the most important thing in the world to them, but are they still thinking that at six o'clock at night? So it's very, very hard to always be eating and be mindful with your nutrition of what your other goals are. They may be your goal, but there's gotta be a way. It's very different. Like, you know, planning you know, three workouts is very different than planning, you know, every time somebody's gonna put something in their mouth. Yeah. Yeah. So what I find is that I really wanna talk about why diets don't work, but diets, think about it like a light switch. Like diets are either on or off. You're either on a diet shining bright or you're off a diet and the light is off. But nutrition is an ongoing, ever evolving thing. So I like to think of it as a light switch on a dimmer that never goes off. There's gonna be times that you're shining bright and doing exactly what it is that's on your plan. And then there's gonna be some times that that switch is on dim, but most of the time it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. So it's not an on off thing. So. I find like diets fail because they're unsustainable and they don't take into account any of the factors of real life. So when you're on a diet, you have to want that more than anything else. So if you want to be on the diet, but you want a piece of chocolate cake, like then you're off of your diet. Mm. So it's not. Damn it. <laughs> no, I just don't want to be off my diet because I had some chocolate cake. But it, it would be considered, you know, if you're on a diet that doesn't allow that, that's a failure. So a diet is a very, very temporary thing because it doesn't allow for or navigate for or give you solutions for the times that you would make what would be a mistake, which would be a failure. Right. But I don't want to look at it as a success and a failure. It's a journey that you're on. Right. So a, a, a bodybuilder or, or a figure athlete or even maybe somebody who's who's like a month out from a really important beach vacation or right. a wedding or something where they really, really, really like all they care about. I need to look great yeah. on stage. I need to look great for the pictures. You, you're sort of making this philosophical difference between what a diet is versus what like the humanity of life of a sustainable nutrition Correct. program is, right? And that's going to change as your level of motivation changes. Right. So your level of motivation, if somebody just had a heart attack and leaves the hospital, they're going to have one level of motivation. Yeah. If you have a wedding coming in a month, you have a level of motivation. That motivation, while well, great for that time, is unsustainable. Yeah. So what I want to look at is the big picture, the long term. Not that we can't help people that have just had a heart attack or that are getting married in a month. But with the diet, and I'll go into it in a little bit, is that the results from a diet are temporary. Yep. You will get where you need to be, but what do you do after that? Yep. Yeah, and, you, and you've done this, right? Because you've, you've competed where the diet was the thing that mattered. And you, could, you couldn't have that piece of chocolate cake. You couldn't, like, all that mattered for those last few weeks going into a bodybuilding show right. going, is, is what goes in your mouth. When you're on a, a diet like that, the diet is your life. Yeah. You cannot live a life on a diet. Yeah. So when I have been on a diet like that, and I've gotten, of course, amazing results, and I've dieted and eaten almost nothing for 16 weeks and gotten on stage at 5 or 6% body fat, a month later, with all the knowledge and everything I know, I still look like I did three months prior to starting right. the diet. Right, because it's and completely it's an unsustainable. endless cycle. Yeah. Yep. So you said you eat almost nothing. For 16 weeks. <laughs> so how many calories a day is that? So you were an IFBB bodybuilder. Yeah. Pro professional professional bodybuilder. physique competitor. Right. Yes. Right. So actually one. Yeah. So what does that look like? Nobody knows yeah, what like, that's what like. Were your, what was your low end of calories that um, you had to eat per day? Low end, probably sustained in the six to 700 range Jesus. with three plus hours of activity a day, seven days a week. And what that looked like was white fish, basically any white fish without fat, and zucchini or cucumber and water. <laughs> that sounds horrible. That's an and extreme. And it is horrible, right? I'm I mean, that's, that why but that's why you're talking about it this way, that one of the things that I think fits well with the the lifestyle piece that Scott and I talk about so often in, with Barbell Logic is that like that's that's not a life. That's not a, that, that's not a, that doesn't improve your quality of life. Right now, at the time, that was because that was your goal and you were super driven and you were like, this is the goal that I'm going to achieve. That was the thing that mattered and it's fine. But for the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, or even just for the people who are listening to the show, 
what I'm hearing you say is that a diet doesn't represent an improvement in quality of life and it is never sustainable. It, it'll work for a little while, but it's not going to last. Correct. So what will last? And what, what do you do that's going to, like, what's the different approach that you would take with somebody who's not a physique competitor for somebody who's like, I just want to do this for the long haul to be healthy and have a better lifestyle, which again, I think most of our clients, they understand the need to be strong and strength is performance. But I think ultimately they would also say that, that health and quality of life are even above that. So how would you approach it differently for, for this type of person? I think the very first thing is to educate, is to be able to help somebody sort through the mess that's out there. Like how does somebody go on the internet and you look up, how do I lose weight, anything like that? We have so many different options and they're polar opposites of each other. High carb, low carb, intermittent fasting, eat seven meals a day. Keto, this diet, that diet, is gluten bad for me? Like where do you begin? And I think we begin by education. So what, what palatable education, you know, at the level, somebody may, you know, not want to know the chemical structure of a protein, but to educate somebody on a level that they could understand in small bits. So they have to, that comes first. They have sure. to know, you know, how much should I be eating and quality. So quality and quantity can't be dismissed. So, you know, we eat more than we need, we gain weight, we eat less than we need, we lose weight. So that comes first, but on top of that, layering real life solutions. So, you know, we start with what's ideal at the bottom. And then on top of that, we add what is realistic and strategizing, you know, rather than reacting to what somebody did the week before, you know, well, your weight is up. We are proactive about solutions going forward and recognize that those things are gonna change. Which might look like what? So somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have this coming up on this coming weekend, Friday and Saturday. Right. And so you're, you're planning ahead for that rather than the report coming in on Monday saying, I screwed up on Friday and Saturday. Which both of those are important, but right. those screw ups, you know, somebody check, the most important part is the communication with the client is one, they're being honest. So I wanna develop a relationship where somebody is honest enough that if they just blew off the diet for three days, that they're comfortable telling me that. Mm -hmm. And then it takes a little bit of time. You gotta look at what are the things that are causing them to, you know, not follow the plan and just strategize of what each of those obstacles is and also recognize the changing nature of their needs. And they're going to have interest in trying different approaches. So when we come back to the quantity and quality, you could um, be a vegan and work on quantity and quality. You could come to me, you know, be very interested in, hey, I really like this idea of intermittent fasting. I think that would work really well for me. If we look at the big picture and the science, we could do that with quantity and quality. There is no one right approach that's for everybody. It's finding the best approach for that person at that particular time right. and understanding that's gonna change. Scott, you've done, I know you've, your weight has fluctuated pretty significantly over the last several years. How dare fair? you? No, it has not fluctuated. It has, <laughs> yes, it has. No, it hasn't. It's just well, gone but you up. Know what well, okay, so your body fat has <laughs> some, right? Yeah, so, right. and you, you've done a bunch of this. Have you have you noticed, like, what Jillian's saying and that, like, hey, can you go back to times over the last several years where either you were, like, super, super crazy committed and it worked for a while, but, like, you're like, I can't fucking sustain this. I don't, you know, like I'm, I'm out with family at Thanksgiving. I'm not pulling up my fitness pal and inputting my macros I'm, or, or no. I mean, is there a time that you can go back and you can relate to this where like, sometimes this is sustainable for me and I figured that out. And other times like it might even work a little bit better, but I can't sustain it that long. Gosh, I, I'm the wrong guy to talk to about this today. Uh, <laughs> why? Because you're, because I just don't care. <laughs> so, I thought you were going to go the opposite direction. No, I mean, I just don't care. You know, uh, I, I I weigh every morning. This I'm 6'2". I weigh 238. Yeah. Uh, pretty strong. I don't have to worry about what I'm eating very much. And it's just... But sometimes you do. You've texted me and been like, let's get at it. Let's lose some yeah. weight. Let's get on my... You know, like, so what's the... What do you think... What's the thing that makes that sort of paradigm shift in your head? Well, I just have to have room in my mind for... Uh, and uh, that project, right? Because uh, I've got so much RAM, I got like so much computing yeah. power, I've got so yeah. much mental energy available, and um, like like I had that little surgery earlier this year, so I knew I wasn't going to be training, and I knew there were a lot of things I wasn't going to be doing. Well, that was a pretty good time to go mess with this with with diet because yeah. I just can't 
I can't I can't do well with all of the things, you know. So yeah. what Scott just said is exactly what I'm speaking to is the cyclical nature of our motivation and priority of that. Right. So a diet means you prioritize, that is number one, but we don't live life like that. So how do we take somebody from putting them on a temporary diet to helping them improving their quality of life, improving their training, and understand that there's gonna be a cyclical nature to their level of motivation, their level of give a, I'm not gonna say bad words on there. <laughs> but, <laughs> My mom's gonna listen to this. Yeah. So that's Best what to is give. to be able to go through the process with somebody. And so if Scott right now doesn't have it in him, you know, the bandwidth, that's all there is for it. What can I do for him right now? Because sure. the coaching process, I'm not, we're not doing a four week plan or a 12 week plan. We're in it with them. The same way we walk through somebody that's had a back injury or a surgery, there's going to be times in life that that diet and counting and stuff are not your number one priority. And I personally experienced it myself this year with stuff that I've gone through in life, but that there's always something, like I said, that dimmer is on. It's not completely off. Yep. So it doesn't mean Scott's not laying on the couch, you know, shoveling Twinkies and ice cream in his face all day. There is some level of that. And I think continuing with somebody, sparking what that is, and understanding that there are social, psychological, cultural, emotional aspects to eating needs to be on top of, like layered on top of what's ideal. Yep. That you're going to fall off. There's times that you don't care. You may have, you know, if there's something that you want to try, I encourage people to explore it. That's how they learn. So, you know, and someone's like, what are my ideal macros? Like, we're going to figure it out. There's no ideal. There is what is working for you right now. And I think to teach somebody is the bottom line. I think if I'm being honest, I've, I don't think I've ever had sustainable nutrition in my life ever. Like I'm, <laughs> Well, and, and, well, I mean, let me like, I just want to be honest about it Let's, and a little bit vulnerable. Like, I actually don't think that I've ever had a dimmer in my life from a nutrition standpoint. Like, it's 100% on, <laughs> what, or it's 100% off. What do you off. have a dimmer for? <laughs> that is, maybe that is true. That is kind of true. It's my personality, I guess, huh? Hmm. Um, <laughs> you got to psychoanalyze me. My, my dimmer, like this weekend, we went, in Fort, went to Fort Worth, saw Darren, and uh, we went to a barbecue restaurant. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, you guys went to a couples meet. Yeah, and you won it, and you you won't say it, but I will. But so congratulations well, to your charity. You. Thank you for winning the couples meet. I saw your beautiful five hundred pound pull, <laughs> uh, nice and smooth. Forty nine. Didn't slow count. down. Didn't slow down for a second. <laughs> Talk about grinding for five. If you had grinded for five seconds, it would have been at your mid shin. I know. You had to grind for thirty two seconds to get it's that a, thing. It's anyway, a all right. So so you go to a barbecue restaurant, halting deadlift. Yeah, that's right. PR. So you went. You went to a barbecue restaurant? Yeah, and I got a sandwich. And that was it? Yeah, I didn't and get to get that, like the eight meat, you know? Makes me so feel, angry. And did you feel like that was a sacrifice or were you like, no, nah, it's fine? I felt like it was an affront to my being. Yeah, I felt like it was a sacrifice. <laughs> and then, you know, after right. me, you know, Darren brought in all this awesome, like, wood fired brick, brick oven pizza stuff. You know, I had three pieces instead of a pizza, you know? I right. hate, I hate denying myself. But you did. So, but I did. It's funny, though. So you, this, so you said four minutes ago that you just don't care right now. But, like, you obviously care enough to be able to no, make... You, no, right now, like, right, right, no, like, right now, I don't care. Oh, like, like literally two days ago. You <laughs> yeah, did. that was three now days ago. Right. Right. right, right, So, okay. that's yeah. another point I want to speak to. When he says, right now, he doesn't care, we... Think about how many different thoughts you have throughout the day. I like to teach people that every time they eat is a chance to make a choice every single time. Sure. And don't carry that over. You make the best choice you can make at the moment. Sometimes you knowingly make a bad choice. Wipe the slate clean. You're gonna get to eat again three hours later, which is another opportunity to make a good choice. People carry so much guilt. And like once they go off for the day and start the day off wrong, they're like, well, I ruined it for the day. So I challenge them to think differently. It's like, well, you made this choice. Guess what? Three hours from now, you have another chance to make a choice of what's best for you. Get rid of the guilt, you know, because that just, again, that comes back to that on again, off again thing. So maybe sometime, possibly after Scott trains today, if he's going to train, maybe he's going to feel differently. Maybe he does care in that moment. And we want to add up more moments of that where you know, you care about it sure. than when you don't. Are there, Scott, are there things that make you care? <laughs> are there things that make me care? Yeah, I mean, for real. Uh, like, I, like, are there real, like, can you go back and go, like, these things push me to, like, want to care? 
Does did the comp- uh, This was really was that this was really your first competition, right? You had never yeah. competed in lifting. Yeah. Did that make you care or no? No. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> no. no. Is there anything? The things that make me care are will I need to buy new jeans? Okay. Such a go. financial <laughs> you're such a So everybody has a threshold and I talk about that too cuz when you're just living life and you're comfortable in your jeans and you're not that unhappy and you're you're aware and honest with yourself that you're getting like you're getting out what you put in everybody has a threshold that they reach where they suddenly start to care whether it's my jeans don't fit i went to the doctor and i got my blood work you know i have some lifestyle change but most of the time most of us exist somewhere below that threshold so nutrition coaching a lot of that is about finding direction habits being able to coach when we're below that threshold when somebody's at that threshold they're highly motivated and they're going to stick to a plan. But what do we do the rest of the time? Yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. I have to pay attention for times when I do have some agency. And then, right. you know, and then buy the sandwich instead of the nine meat and, uh, you know, not eat the pizza because, the, you know, other times it's just not important to me. Yeah. I, th- I think I've tried to think about this a lot for me. Like, one, for me, training will drive my nutrition for me, not the other way around. So, if I'm not training consistently, my nutrition is going to be crap. But when I start to train, I actually, in, because I enjoy training, and I, and I know not all people do, but I actually really enjoy training, then I actually think about eating for performance. So that works for me, and I know it doesn't work for a lot of other people. Um, and then and vacations do it for me. Like we typically take, if we go on a vacation, it's typically to, to a beach type place. And that'll be that'll be some motivation for me, but it's very difficult for me in the kind of the mire and the muck of the normal day, business working. I don't. It's not even about emotional eating for me. It's more about convenience eating. And I'm not like a fast food guy. I'm just like, could somebody bring me some food? What do you want? I don't care. It would be convenient to put this in my mouth right now. Yeah, just just put anything down in front of me, and so that I can eat it because I'm too busy and I've got too much work and I have too much too many things to do. And if I'm also not training at that time, now it's completely different. If I'm like, hey, I'm going to squat and deadlift this afternoon, if that's going on, like that, if I'm certain that I'm going to squat and deadlift that day or whatever it is, then the, it completely changes my nutrition habits. The problem is when I when I'm in the middle of of just you know a crazy business season or you know just this this crazy amount of work. And I realize that I'm not going to train for three or four or five days or a week even. Um, and I ha- and there's no vacation on the calendar. And, there, you know, so all of those sort of things that are are sort of my own external motivators to, to drive me to success aren't there. I struggle, right? So making those decisions about, hey, you know, this, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I'll eat the six pieces of pizza instead of the two or whatever it is. And it's, it's like it's just out of convenience and it's, I don't know, there may, there may be more comfort to it than I think there is. Um, it's not, I don't know, it's not, it's not in my head. I don't cognitively understand that I'm eating out of, out of comfort, but I probably am. I agree. And I think when you're working with a client, it's about managing expectations and having that difficult discussion up front. Like what you're willing to put in is what you're will, what you're going to get out of this. Yep. Like if you're able to plan ahead, food prep, do those things, this is going to be the outcome. But to also recognize that most people are not going to be able to, are not going to want to, be willing to, be prepared to do that all the time. So what do we do in that case when somebody's not going to plan ahead for success? So that's when I talk about being able to strategize the obstacles that come up. Yeah. So how do you do that? I mean, part part of the thing I hear you say is that like it's humanity. People are just humans, and so they. And I'm not making an excuse for them. I'm just saying that that needs just one of those deals where I think sometimes we we tend to make nutrition just actually just like we make can make training completely academic, right? Yep. Put it on the piece of paper, follow the things, here's your macros, get on the app, track the thing. And if you'll actually do that, it works really well. Correct. The problem is is that like 80% of the time, people don't want to do that. And so they end up white knuckle, dis- just like this white knuckle discipline and they'll do it for two weeks or whatever and then fall off the horse because they, they hate it. They don't want to do it, right? And so trying to figure out like, okay, th- the problem with going with a singular approach and I, and I know that you absolutely like you've you've got your clients all over the place on the approaches that you take is that because people are human and they have different things that drive them and they have different things right. that make things like 
for some people you could go, Hey, um, you know, how much alcohol are you drinking? And they're yep. like, yeah, I don't know, two or three glasses a day. And you're like, you know, what are the non-negotiables? I'm like, well, I mean, like I'll give up alcohol. I don't yep. care. I don't need this for me. Like I'm going to have a glass or two of whiskey every day, no matter what. And I'm not giving it up, but, <laughs> but I could go the rest of my life and never eat dessert. So that's a discussion point we talked about. We talked about when I do nutritional intake, one of the things I ask is what are somebody's non-negotiables? I want to get to know the person and what drives them. And when I come up the approach for them, personality is has to be considered. Right. So is this a very, you know, neurotic person that has to weigh and measure or track everything? Like where is that person at in their life? What is their personality like? What are their non-negotiables? What do they like and dislike? There's a million things out there that you could eat. Yes, some people hate vegetables and I wanna get them eating veggies, but if the plan's gonna be sustainable to them, we have to take into account all of those things. The other thing is when we talked about a diet, a diet is very singular. A diet is for one individual and it often causes stressful situations for other people in the home. So someone goes on a diet, they're no longer eating meals with their family. If we are doing nutritional coaching for long-term success, the bigger picture needs to be considered. You know, the holistic picture, are you eating meals with your family? You know, are you going out on dates on the weekends? Is it important to have pancakes with your children on a Sunday morning? Because people are doing this to be better and feel better in life. Their yeah. life is not a diet for most people. Yeah, I know like for, for McKay, and we talked about Brett, he, he told me that Brett will eat anything you ask him to eat during the day. Mm -hmm. And he's like, but I'm eating dinner with my family and my wife makes dinner and whatever she makes, I'm eating. And he's like, and you know, he's like, most of the time it's, it's healthy. It's like, you know, most people, if they make, if they make a, a homemade dinner at home, it's usually not too bad. Right. But he's like, it's sometimes like a lot of times it's a casserole. So like, how do you, you can't count yeah. your macros in a casserole. He's like, I'm not doing it, man. So he's, he's, he has no problem being strict during the day, eating the right things for, for breakfast and lunch and the protein shakes and whatnot. But then at dinner, he's just like, I'm, you know, like I'm going to eat whatever my wife makes. Cause I'm not going to be that guy that's eating something different than my wife and my two kids. So, and so that's been really sustainable for him for, gosh, about three years now. He's made a massive difference, and it just, it just works. It's super. That's, sometimes when I ask people, you know, what is important to you, you know, as part of nutritional counseling, they just they don't understand why I'm asking that question, but that's exactly why I'm asking it. Yeah. It's because those things need to, re, your priorities need to remain that. And another question I ask, which is difficult for people, is what are their goals, and then to order their goals you know, which is sure. tough, you know, that hard conversation, like somebody wants to, you know, get stronger and, and lose body fat and having that difficult conversation. And one of the things the first week I do is help them put those goals in order. Yep. One thing has to have priority over something else. And also to know that that may change over time, but the direction we're going into, again, that you can't have everything, yep. but to help them prioritize that. Yeah, I like that. So this is the Getting Started series. People are listening, they're like, I'm getting started with this. I don't have a nutrition coach. I can't afford a nutrition coach. Like, what are some takeaways for them that are listening that they're like, where do I start? Like, where's, where's the first place they start? I think a little bit of is examining where they get in the way of themselves, even if it's making a list of what are the things like, you know, I don't go grocery shopping over the weekend or, you know, when I start Monday morning, my house is completely barren. I don't have a dozen eggs or milk and just writing that down and being honest. Most people know. I mean, I think there is, there's some people that are like, tell me what to eat. Just tell me what to eat. And you see that all the time, right? Yeah. So just tell me what to eat and they'll be great for a week, but it's about them learning how to eat for their own needs and what they're going to continue to do. Yep. So I would even have a person individually on their own start by writing the list of what their own non-negotiables are and understanding that there's a way to work that into it. Are you saying somebody that's not getting a nutrition coach, where yeah. do they begin? They're just, yeah, they're just, they're just listening. They're just like, man, I'm just trying to figure this all out. I've seen all these different diets. I've seen, you know, keto and I've seen paleo and I've seen intermittent fasting and, and, you know, where do they start to figure out like what the, what's right for them? No extremes, no extreme diet, okay. healthy eating. So we're not going to start with an extreme. Um, if they're trying to lose weight, you don't want to cut calories so much that you're going to end up causing binge behavior. For somebody that doesn't know, like if I'm working with somebody, I'll set them at about 15% below what their maintenance is. Somebody that knows nothing is not going to know 
what, what that their is, is, what their right. maintenance level is. But to focus a diet on whole foods, I mean, you could look up, most people know what that is or have access to what that is. Sure. And Single not, ingredient foods. Not right. to fall into the trap of a particular diet plan that eliminates entire food groups. Right. You know, it really comes down to like whole foods, variety, portion, how much do I need for me? And, you know, what are those foods? And then the number one thing I talked to you about is what we talked to Dan, like eating at home. Anytime you make something at home, it's way different than if you ate that same meal out. If you sure. make, you know, a burrito at home, that's not the burrito that you're getting in a Mexican restaurant. Sure. It also doesn't taste as good. <laughs> I, I went to Charleston's uh, Sunday night. Yeah. And I ordered, what did I order? Well, but it came with the glazed carrots. Right. Uh, I, like I ordered something carrots. reasonable. I don't remember what it was. It's a vegetable. Right. It's good. And I put the first one in my mouth. I was like, oh, no. Oh, this is butter and brown sugar. It's butter and brown sugar and a little bit of garlic. <laughs> so good, some, though. Yeah. Like those, <laughs> I have no... I have no idea how much fat was in those stupid carrots. Yeah, that's the problem. I yeah. ate them all. I licked the plate. It was fine. Oh, you oh you didn't stop. You no. I thought you were <laughs> No. <laughs> I thought you were about to give a personal testimonial there of uh I had took my first bite and was like, Nope, can't have that, not eating uh -huh. that. And you're like, No, I actually ate them all and then I drank the juice out of the bottom <laughs> of the bowl. I licked the plate. It was yeah, they looked, but I left an extra tip and it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like so for people who are getting started having an idea that self-awareness and where they're at, even the visual, visual food diary. So, you know, we, we, what we do with our clients, we just have them take pictures of everything they eat for yep. like three, four, five days a week, whatever. You can do that on your own and you can get a really good idea of what you're eating. And you can go back and look and be like, okay, I see I see where, <laughs> where the struggle is, right? It's those carrots. It's those carrots. It's those for me, it ain't carrots. carrots. Yeah, and then, and then to identify what their non-negotiables are. So like, hey, I want to be able to go on a date with my wife on Friday night and eat at a restaurant or whatever it is, right? Or I want to be able to have that one glass of alcohol or that two two glass of alcohol a, a day, and I'm not giving that up. Um, and figure out, and then it's kind of like a budget, right? They just have to figure out. Well, okay, once you figure out your non-negotiables, then what are the negotiables? What are the things that we can sort of have a trade trade off with? And I think the other thing is people get in the way of themselves because they get so caught up on like the science and exact numbers, like what should be my percentages of like carbohydrates and fats, should it be 30% this and 40% that? And people think of everything rather than the big picture is what happens in a single day. You know, I right. failed to hit my macros in a single day. I was under on my protein. I was over on my protein. Your body doesn't start and stop right. in single day intervals. So it really is looking at that big picture. So even somebody starting out, you know, how many grams of carbohydrates versus how many grams of fats, like that may be different from one day to the next. It may be different to what you have access to. Again, it's com total amount of food, you know, the calorie, whether you're really specifically counting it on my fitness pal or something, or just portion control absolutely matters. And then fill your plate with the highest quality food that you could find. You know, we want, you know, that fresh piece of meat and not the beef jerky. Sure. For, <laughs> for most of our people, I think you and I have talked about this too, Scott, is that it's just for these, these our clients that get started or the people that email the show, what we found is that most of them are eating enough carbohydrates and fat. But well, you they get are. some under, you get some underweight, but, and almost all of them are vastly under eating protein. And so for a lot of our getting started people, it's just like, you know what? A lot of them just need to double their protein intake, right? Or if, like, if you're a guy, get your 200 grams of protein in. If you're a female, you're getting in your, your, you know, your 125 to 150, like whatever that is, right? So it's amazing when you start to look at that visual food diary and you're like, oh, here, here's a female who's eating 35 grams of protein a day. Here's a guy right. who's eating 67 grams of protein a day. But there's also people that don't know where protein comes from. Correct. Like I have a little joke that I make and it makes people laugh about protein. And like, how do I know what a complete protein is? Like I've had people come into my gym that think a banana is protein. Right. And I make them laugh and I was like, a protein is something that has eyes or could look at you or came from something that has eyes. So I right. tell them, envision something that looks looks back at them. I like to look into its eyes. I <laughs> and it instantly you like simplifies. like to look into its eyes while it gives you protein? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like where you get a complete protein yeah. from. And their kids can remember that. So yeah. it's just being able to group foods and simplifying 
nutrition people there's you're just so overwhelmed yeah. with it so i'd like to do a, like a little we still do a little lecture in my gym and it really just comes down to quantity and quality yep. like those are the two things we look at we don't need to get super sciency and technical to get results so we as the coach need to know all of need to know that to help a client get where they need to be but some of the clients are going to want that and some are not going to want yeah. that a lot of them are just tell me what to do yeah sure yeah that's good where do you get these tell me what to do clients <laughs> why don't you give me any of those Reynolds? <laughs> i don't i don't divvy out the clients oh, God. <laughs> We give you the clients. You know what clients you get. You get the clients who I want get a questionnaire the say, I want Scott Hambrick. And then he's like, man, why do all the people that request me, why are they, why are, are the, they're like dudes from England with anorexia oh who, are, who are, have Asperger's? You're like, uh, cause that's your fan club, bro. I have a guy. I got, I have a guy. I hope you're listening. <laughs> and he sent me this email. He said, uh, I'm not going to bench anymore. It doesn't fit my, va- with my values. <laughs> um, and he said, "He said I'm 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 not going to bench until uh, until I have a wife who can spot for me." And I was like, "Motherfucker, if you start benching, you got a better chance of getting a wife because it ain't happening for you right now, right? Like like is his one sixty five three by five bench, mm. six three, That's not very good, six three, two hundred forty pound guy. Oh 20, my goodness, twenty nine years old. Yikes. It's like you don't get to make this call. I'm really bad at this, so I've decided I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It's not quite the uh, the voluntary hardship way of life, is it? So, uh, uh, well, look, I mean, it, it also comes down to this. Like we we've talked about this a lot on the show. Like there is no such thing as external motivation. That's what it is, right? Like you you can shout from the rooftops. I can shout from the rooftops. Jillian can shout from the rooftops. And there are going to be some people that listen to this show. And for some other reason, there was already some motivating factor. There was a health factor. There was a a, a divorce there was a whatever it is right they they thought they could fit into that dress and they can't at all or whatever it is and and then they'll hear this and they'll be like okay and they'll be able to use it and internalize it and be motivated but you're never going to convince anybody and you're never going to Jillian you're never going to convince like we can, we can't but for people who want to know and are willing to do this we want to make sure that they have the information they need to be able to actually get started that's the point but a lot of you won't most of you won't. As in <laughs> what one thing is for sure that if you if you are in fact doing this getting started thing that we've been talking about, well, that means that you weren't barbell training before. And so right. one thing is for sure, uh, the things you put in your mouth, the quantity and quality of the things you put in your mouth will have to change. And for some people, that'll mean that they need to eat more. And for some people, they probably if they want to get leaner and you know, get healthier. Uh, some of those people will have to eat less, but yeah. in the service of that, they're going to have to start paying attention to what that is in the food. You know, t- the food I-, I like when people will weigh their food, but that's pretty tough. But yeah. just taking the picture, that's taking the food diary pictures is a big deal because you know, people will find out that like, yeah, I don't really want to immortalize this <laughs> with a picture, <laughs> sure. you know, and it, it makes them stop at least for just that one moment. Yeah, and evaluate what they're going to put in their mouth. Yeah, what's the what's the study where what's it called when like the second you start doing that thing, it immediately changes like yep. what you what's that called? I can't think of the name of the thing, the principle. So basically, that the idea is as soon as you start taking pictures of your food, even if you're like, hey, don't change a thing about the way you eat. Just show us what you're eating for the next four days, but take a picture of it. One hundred percent chance they're going to change what they eat. Yep. Yeah, because now they're taking pictures of it, and that's okay, right? Because you're like, well. Because it usually gets better. <laughs> it doesn't usually get worse. You know, they're not usually like, uh, here are the eight Reese's peanut butter cups that I ate. Right? Exactly. Here's a picture of eight Reese's peanut butter cups. They'd be like, oh, that's embarrassing to take a picture of. Well, you might t- go eat eight, but they almost certainly won't go eat eight more and take a second picture. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you that's know, right. I mean, it keeps them from going back for seconds. It makes yeah. people, I hate this word, be more mindful. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say intentional. Oh, I also hate that word. I know you do. And problematic. So be mindful, mindful and, and intentional and problematic for Scott. Ugh. So, no, that's good. So, so you get a place to start. Start with the visual food diary. Figure out what your non-negotiables are. Whatever your non-negotiables are, as long as they're within reason, right? Like if somebody's like, I- I'd like to eat a-, a gallon of ice cream every single night. You're like, okay. <laughs> that's like that's like You've got to figure yeah. out what that is. But you could... Have ice cream, probably. There, that's possible. Right. right, and the non-negotiable doesn't need to be a food. It could be 
a social event. It could be, I'm yeah. going to take my wife on a date every Friday night. Right. So when we look at the picture, one of the things I like to do is to start somebody with where their obstacles are by having them, especially a month like this in December with holiday parties, put on a calendar all of the times they know they're going to run into a challenge. Yeah. So, you know, just to be able to look at it and know that there's going to be 10 days this month that I'm going to run into a challenge. Yeah. And ag again, it comes back to that being self-aware of what's coming. Yeah, and proactive rather than reactive. Yeah. Because now you know what's coming. So, okay, Friday night I've got a Christmas party and Saturday night I've got a Christmas party. And so, okay, we got we can plan for that, right? So, hey, thank you for being on the show again. Thank so, you, guys. She, Jillian's got this great story. I don't know what podcast episode it is. Do you know what podcast episode it is? Hamburg? I can look it up. If I knew what story you were talking about. I think 99 and Have you been on the show more than once? Yes. It was two parts, 99 and 101. Oh, oh we did. We did back to, okay. Is that what it was? 99 and 100? One, I think 99 and 101. Okay, gotcha. Somewhere there. So, and you can you can hear her background. It's a, it's a pretty amazing story. She's got a pretty amazing mindset uh, that really shows you she, she understands motivation. And again, I, I love it because you've, You've experienced, I've watched you, I've, I've, you and I have known each other for about a decade now. I've watched you walk through both ends of the spectrum of, of really unhealthy relationships with food. <laughs> that's fair to say, right? It like, is, not, it is. So of the, the, the person who sort of ate everything you could get your hands on to just get as strong as possible, and you're like, I don't care if I get fat, I'll eat whatever, I'm just gonna shove food down my gullet. And you've also been the person who ate 600 calories a day to be a IFBB professional fig figure, fitness, physique, physique, physique. there we go. Yep. I got it, close. Um, you know, and, and then everything in between. And so what I like about that is, and I, and I think why you're able to connect with people is because at some point in your life, you've been right where they were. Like you've kind of experienced that entire spectrum. And I think it's and difficult. And you try to find the spark. So I think that may be a little bit, I don't know if Scott's there, but there's times that I'm like, and I've had conversations with Stacy, who's in the room with us, is I don't have that spark right now. Like, you know, you want to eat well and you want to look great and all those things, but like the spark is not there. Right. So what do you do during all of that time where it's in your head, but it's occupying the tiniest little space in there? And that's where most of us live our life. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Such a weird thing, you know, that we have like, uh, that we have to worry about eating in this way. You know, like for almost all of human history, it's like, you know, where are we going to get enough calories to keep the children right. from dying? Yeah, just find find the food. Yeah. Just, like get, just get, get it. We're just not made to know, have to, excess. To, to, to even have choice, really. Right, right. Yeah, it is It is crazy that, that here it is December and it's, you know, it's like foggy outside here and it's about 30 degrees outside. You could eat a kiwi I can drive, if you wanted. I can drive 35 seconds up the road, that's right, and buy, quote unquote, fresh kiwi right now <laughs> that's that's screwed up like we've screwed something up there uh that yeah that's 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 the problem right like the problem is really this is a this is a, a microcosm of the greater problem which is that we have access to everything we want all the time anytime and we're not made to handle it okay here's a rant you ready okay uh we've we've conflated the idea of freedom with choice yeah and so i think I, i've talked to people and i can hear I can hear in the things they say that they actually think that because there are more things that they could potentially have undo that they're freer. Right. And I don't think that's what freedom is. There's a, there's a tyranny in having all that choice and your blood sugar will tell you that, sure. but you'll also, you know, you also experience that when you're just, you know, if you ever walk down the jelly aisle and look at how many flavors of jelly and jam and stuff there are, it's ridiculous. Sure. But anyway, people have conflated freedom uh, with choice. And I just don't think that's true at all. So what is freedom? Freedom is the ability to pursue the excellent unencumbered. Okay. But people don't like that because there is only one highest good and only one excellence. Right. But there are many things that are not that. Right. So uh, I think Father Floater and I would agree that there is one path. Right. And... Actually, if you were restrained to that one path, you would find that that was very freeing. Yeah, maybe true. But the the reality that we live in is that we have unlimited choice, especially awesome. in the Western world, of what we put in our mouth, and therefore there has to we have to have some amount of restraint and discipline. Like, what else are you going to do? 
So there's an exercise that I suggest um, that addresses that a little bit. And it comes down to when you're teaching people how to plan ahead and to do food prep is the challenge is that they shop once for the entire week. And when it gets back to cooking at home, you need to get all of the ingredients. Again, some people have limitations with storage and stuff, whatever you're going to eat this week. And when you run out, you're done. So, you know, the other thing when we talk about nutrition and I'm sure we'll get into more topics, spending on organic versus non-organic is living on a budget. So an additional layer that I look at is how much of someone's budget do they want to spend on food or are they capable of? And one of the exercise of not just having that freedom to go out in any moment is to spend a week where everything they everything that goes into their mouth was purchased at one time in the home the entire week and they get nothing else. You know, especially people that have a lot of food waste, that toss a lot of that, like it teaches people kind of how to shop and eat and get, and I think that's where I was going with that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> because there's tyranny in that choice. <laughs> I hate it. Well, we're not made to, we're not wired to do it, but we have to. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Thank you guys. You guys that have stuck with us for the Getting Started series, we may do one more. We may do, what are we, what are we going to call it again? The, when getting started stops, yeah, we whatever are, it is. Stopping strength. <laughs> stopping strength. <laughs> well, there's another Barbell Logic podcast. Email your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com. And if you got some nutrition ones, throw a nutrition in there, and we'll kick those over to Miss, uh, to Miss Jillian, and maybe she can give you some help. Also, go give us a review on iTunes. Uh, that's always sport for me. I always enjoy that. Thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you soon.